All right, let's start. So you know, we have another lurker in the class, Ryan. So people in other other departments li like our course so much they just come voluntarily. So it's great. Um, so any questions about previous stuff before we move on to new things? Yeah. Um, oh, by the way, the YouTube videos, I have, I have uploaded some, but I have, have to curate them, so I'll let you know when they're okay. posted. Uh, but this, the, the main question was uh, either a like, trolley or yeah, it's, yeah. On the previous, it's on the previous slide, but why is it added? And so when we had, so we had this space from one to one to from zero. So when we were building this tree here, mm -hmm. uh, and we were adding the possibilities, so we had P1, 1, 0, 1, oh, yeah, 0, yeah. 1, and P, was it, what was the other one? Was it just 0, 1, 1? Yeah. Uh, why with this one, I think it was this one, actually. Just, that one. just with yeah. that one. Yeah. It was, why was it added? So that one plus that one, regardless of that, if that was a 0 or a 1. So it was, yeah, so we have one probability with this being a zero here mm -hmm. and one with it being a one here, right? Okay, because it makes the same tree, it makes the same, ter uh, it terminates the same. Right. So we'd have to, okay. so, And so they're not, it's, it's not like you, like you have to do both zero and one, you, you multiply it. Okay. Right, zero or one. Okay. Oh, so it is, it's that one or that one, so it's well, not. It's, it's, no, so the, these are the, the tips. Okay. Right? So the tip is actually this. Okay, okay. So it's gotcha. one, one, zero. If you give one, one, zero, um, so I have my zero to one only position. Right? Uh -huh. So that means, you know, if it were one zero one, one zero one here, then this is zero, and this has to be this is zero one. Zero. It has to be zero. Yeah. Right. Look at that. Right. So here with one zero one, this could be zero or one oh. here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good yep. question. <laughs> uh, what other questions people have? That was a good one. Just go home. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, that's So let's treat it, so the canonical one people always think about is this, okay? Where we have, this is branch length P, 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 and Q, Q, okay? <coughs> and so you think of a uh, plot like this. Everybody gonna have, I forget how it was in the chart, but you, can, you know, you can just act in your head. So P versus Q, right? So if I have them equal to each other, Right, so here, what do you expect? Try and infer the tree or not? It's approximately, or is approximately misleading? Well, if they're equal, then what does that look like here? It looks like, might be okay, right? When, when would it not work well? It says P is really short. Right, P is really small and Q is really big. Right? Um, why? It's more likely that it happened twice during this time than even once during that time. Right. Homoplasy here is more likely than homology here. Right? Which is the is there. Right? And so for approximately, it says, oh, well, you know, you have this tree, but you have Q changes for this character. That's not good. It's much more likely to have, have one change for that character. So then we change it. Right? We would say, 
let's make it AD CB, right? Because it would falsely say this change actually occurred here, right? And so you have this area where <coughs> if Q is big enough and P is small enough, something like this, right? Um, what is that the shape? Um, where approximately has this problem. Right? There's the area it doesn't. So this is the Felsenstein set. Good. Excellent. Other, other questions? Okay. The, uh, or okay. At one point, there was a there was a spot where it was talking about rate and point point one. Were those just arbitrary numbers? Or were those actually? Okay. Yeah, those are arbitrary numbers. Other questions are all set for today's quiz? This is another quiz today, but it might be one on Monday. Okay. On this or? It's cumulative. It'll be on the day, first day. What do I study? Yeah. Um, all right, so today's learning objectives. Um, we're just going to review, touch on this again. Should we get that? Then talk about rate heterogeneity. Talk about plotting a tree. Make sure you all proportional time. And then some, some actual empirical work when the scheme and beast. Okay. C is a general purpose package for you know doing alignment, um, creating trees, doing repetitive methods on trees. So in an alternative universe where R doesn't exist, we're using Skeet. Okay. But it has a graphical user interface. And so it has like menus can pull down. And for a lot of people, you know, two years from now when you're we haven't done R for a while, you can dive back in and use some Skeet and get the speed of it pretty quickly. R might take a little longer. For reproducibility and for you know ease of analysis, in the long run, R works better for many things, right? But for just quickly looking at your data or something like that, you see can be very handy. So I'm going to learn about that. And Beast is a program for inferring a tree under a Bayesian criterion. Okay. So <coughs> what you learn from this is how you set priors. Talk about that. Right. So, and again, I mean the goal in the core. core to make you a mesquite expert or beast expert, right? But three years from now, when someone says, "Oh, you have to correct your phylogeny," or you know, here's a data set, was, "How does it look?" She will know. Oh, I should go look at that thing again and get into it. Okay. <coughs> All right. So we've talked about having this rate matrix, right? And then having simplified in various ways: general time reversible, HKY, choose Cantor. Okay. Um, what what do you think fits best for most data sets? Out of just those three. Juice Cantor, HKY, and uh, GTR. Why? Okay. But so does HKY also limits parameters. It limits even more parameters. What? Maybe HKY is better. All right. <laughs> How about Juice Cantor? Well, that's even simpler. That seems not good. <laughs> All right. There's a lot of information. All right. And so. If you're thinking about these criteria we have for picking models, right, you want to have the one that minimizes the information loss. Um, and so, so it depends on how complex the data set are, right? And I mean, if this were the true model of evolution, that this is how you know, organisms actually evolve, you'd hope this would fit best, right? Um, part of it would be the case, right? And so we find in empirical data sets, <coughs> we find, you know, here's GTRs, so the, the frequency at which Different models are chosen different data sets. Okay? And um, Juice Cantor by itself is not here. Right? Um, but yeah. but you know, GTR is here. Okay? So almost all data sets in practice use a GTR model. Okay? That's the best fitting model. You guess two answers and one of them is right. <laughs> I said the one that I five and just swayed me. <laughs> all right. Um, those are the eyes and gannets then. 
All right, so talk about what those mean next. Okay, but the basic story here is that you know for real data sets tend to use complex models. Now, if you find that the most complex model is the best one fit, what might that suggest? A complex system is it being well fit by the model? I mean, possibly, right? But we don't know. It could be the truth is actually GTR, and then like it's fitting well because the true model, perfect. But it could be as much more complex than that. How can we test that? Stuff. Always. How would you? What? Which, which likelihood stuff? Hey, I see with with well with what though. <laughs> We're getting there. Yeah. AIC with the yeah. Perfect. Right. So you try making it more complex and see, you know, it is a more complex model up here that fits much better. Then you find that nope, this is still the best model. Right. If we're up at this boundary, maybe the best model is somewhere way out here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yes. Um, there's some covariant models that um, you can imagine something like this, right? I kind of switch into different matrix where I have no changes. So I go from having A and A to having zero. And then of course, you know, two make it. Um, and then also there's like code on models and things like that. All right, so for a protein coding DNA, it's actually three base pairs that code to amino acid, right? So you imagine that you know, the selection for not going to become a stop codon, right? This is models that model that explicitly. Um, <coughs> we've got a grant to actually work on complex models of that sort that actually deal with selection and have selection on amino acids. Um, so these are even more complex. But the ones that are available in uh, you know, commonly used programs, like these we're used today, are like GTR and simpler. Okay. Um, yeah. The other thing people can do is look, look at model adequacy. Right. So model fit tells you which model is least bad. Model ad adequacy tells you your model is good enough. Right. So how that's commonly done is by simulating under your model, and then seeing if your simulated data sort of tastes like your real data in some way. Um, so for example, if you found that you know your real data had 15 changes on the tree, and simulated data sets under that model only had five changes on every tree. Yeah, the, the simulator is acting differently than my real data. Right. So maybe my real data is missing some aspect of the signal. Okay. That's something people have done a little bit in this kind of um, molecular evolution, not very much yet. It's something that the field is moving towards more and more. Right. So we had a paper published on a new method for comparative methods, and we actually did more out to the show, like, oh, look, it, looks, it works better than the existing stuff. It fits better, but also it seems to match how data behaves. So, in our recent grant, yes, other than that, not much. Um, there's a few models that, a few codon models where you can have, like, or amino acid models, you can have, like, an advantage of a gain to some optimal amino acid rather than a loss. And there allows some asymmetry there, but in general, you have asymmetry. Which makes it so that, you know, the unrooted likelihood is the same as the rooted likelihood. Right? Where we had asymmetry, you can actually use that to help get at the directionality of, of, of evolution. Good. Other questions? Okay. So this model is you know, the most complex commonly used, and it's still trivially simple, right? Okay. Well, can make it more complex? <coughs> well, you might think that you know, the rates differ at different sites, right? So what might be what might be a reason for that? What, 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 what do you mean? Uh, 
So then, what I'm thinking about for data here are just nucleotide data. Mm -hmm. All right, so I have. <coughs> Um, yeah, so why do I think that, you know, this site is much faster than this site, say? Well, biologically, look at the leading to that pattern. Mm -hmm. Right, you have your kind of domination and have mutations happening as a result of that process, right? So you have different mutational rates at different parts of the chromosome. Good. What else? Mm -hmm. Right. So you have something that's non-coding or an intron or something like that, um, then maybe it's under no selection or less, at least less selection than things that are coding for, you know, your hemoglobin genes. Right? You need that, those to work. Right? But an intron in a gene, if it, does, if it you know, add an extra base pair, probably doesn't matter. Good. Okay, what else? Yep, you could have codon bias. So first of all, you just have even the nature of codons, right? So um, <laughs> ATG and ATC, I believe, code for the same amino acid, right? But um, KTG is not. And so you could have this change. This is fairly neutral. The codon bias is not completely neutral, right? So you could have that affecting it. But also, this change would be more likely than this change. This means it's a different amino acid. So my expect then faster rates here than here. Okay. <coughs> so all these reasons that can lead to heterogeneity and rate of evolution along a sequence. Okay. Um, and one way that's dealt with is with this gamma function. What does I think about gamma? Okay, so gamma is a two-parameter continuous function. Okay, um, just like a normal distribution is a two-parameter continuous function. Right, but gamma can have various cool shapes. The normal just bell curve all the time. Um, <coughs> and what people have done, following the work by Yang and before, is for phylogenetics assume that rates are gamma distributed. Okay. And set this is only one free parameter. So, so there's two parameters in gamma. We set it such that one is the of the other. Okay. Then I'll always give the curve something like this. Okay. But by changing the parameters, you can spread out this curve and make it tighter. Okay. And what we do is then bid things and say, okay, rather than having a single rate for all my for all my sites, I'll say there's four four rates. Mid, mid, the middle one here, 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 and here. Okay. And I have I think I can pull the map and have similar, but more spread apart. Okay. And when I'm calculating the likelihood, right, so we calculate like likelihood before with those zeros and ones, but I do it once with the slow rate, once with the next highest rate, once with the next highest rate, once with the next highest rate, and add them together. Okay. So we're calculating the likelihood under, in this case, four models or six models um, <coughs> and combining them. Right. And the hope there is that if this is evolving under a model where change is very rare. It will fit very well under a slow rate model. Right? And if this is the only model where it's faster, this will fit better well under a fast rate model. Okay. The one weird thing about this um, is that we kind of want to use all four models at once. So it's not that you say, oh, the slow rate model works best for this one, and the fast rate works best for this one, so you should use those. You actually average across all those models. Okay. Even so, Empirically, we find that it fits much, much better to have a given distribution for, for most data sets. All right, so you see <coughs> almost everything here, except for just pure GTR, has this gamma. Okay, for real data sets, this heterogeneity matters, and gamma helps get it better. Okay. Now, an interesting thing is that, you know, since we know that all these models is like the same, we use the same model for DNA as you use for, you know, eye presence, eye absence, or things like that, right? But for gamma, so far it's only been implemented for nucleotides. You can imagine doing it for amino acids, you can imagine doing it for eyes, right? No one has yet. That's when you do, you know, chapter one dissertation, bring it out next week, right? We're extending these to, you know, 
mor morphological traits. Pretty easy how you, once you see the connections, it's pretty easy to see how to extend things. Okay. <coughs> now this I is varying sites. You might say, I think that some certain portion of sites just can never change. Um, so you can try fitting that model too. Which is like, so you can have you know, maybe a, a fifth rate category in the game effectively with the zero changes. Not quite the same as that, but it's your idea. Okay, so that's another complex, a more complex model you'll see often. Okay, so for most most logic inference programs, you have a choice of you know, just Cantor, HKY, GTR, and then yes invariant sites, yes gamma. Okay. Any questions about that? Mm -hmm. yep. So with the numbers here, the number of three parameters. Right, so GTR, there's a six, right? Um, they actually made this base, it's only five and one set to be one. You have the three, eight, you don't have the base frequencies, and you have the I and the gamma. Yeah. What's GTR plus I or GTR plus I. Good, good eye. When I was taking a, taking a course like this, we were um, reading Felsenstein. So Joe Felsenstein, who we talked about before, wrote a book about phylogenetic methods, and it's a great book to get. And so, but one of my one of the instructors actually got a preprint of it from Felsenstein, and so we were reading it. And I found an error in it. It's like, oh! And so we wrote a little email to Felsenstein. I'm mean, acknowledged in the book. It's my it's my greatest idea of accomplishment. It's like I found I found a small thing Felsenstein got wrong, you know. And so I memorialized this acknowledgement number eighty five. You can be that person now. <laughs> All right, so those are the most common models for nucleotides, but there are many other models you can do. So this is actually pretty common now. Group models are different sites. Right? So if I have a mitochondrial gene and a nuclear gene, okay, probably under very different rates of evolution, different selective pressures. Okay. Why is the same? You know, different codon biases. So I use the same model for both. So you will often partition those in different models. We might say first base, first codon positions have a different rate model than third codon positions. We model that too. And there's various ways of picking how do you segregate your data into these different models. Right? So we have ways of deciding you know, do, you, do you GTR or do you use Cantor. Right? But that's something that you right? so Most people will at least segregate by gene, perhaps by site. Um, one sort of cool result is that if you make a model such that every site has its own rate, um, you need to go back to a parsimony model. So you can actually make a likelihood model that acts like parsimony. You use the same tree as parsimony back. Okay. But it's a crazy parameter rich model where everything has its own rate. Um, okay. Um, you have this covariant model I was talking about, which I turn on You have amino acid models, you have correlated models. You think about you know, our only key RNA. Right? You have the teaching, how you have this sort of structure. Right? So you have these pairs here, right? All the structure together. And so if this is an A and this is a U, if this mutates to a G, then it better mutate to a C. Right? So we're on the structure on selection pressure. And so we find you know, they're correlated on the stems, whereas on the loops, they're not. 
and so you can have models for this. And so for like all well, like ribosomal protein, run right ribosomal genes, we have this sort of thing here, so 20s, 18s, 16s, right? Where you have this RNA in cool structure with all the secondary structure. And then this pairing might matter. And so we have problems to do with that. Okay. Um, and various other exotic models. Right, any questions about that? So one we talked about earlier was what branch lengths mean. Right? And branch lengths mean amount of change, but also mean time. Or at least mean what looks pretty in the plot. Right? Um, we often want them to be proportional to time. Why? Yeah, so it's a natural skill for looking at things, right? So yeah, I don't care about how many times CO one's changed. I care about, you know, did mammals did you know primates exist in the time of dinosaurs? Not even dinosaurs. <coughs> right. Um, also for our questions that deal with rates of evolution, we care about time too. We want to have great portions of time. Right? How much has you know horse leg length changed per per million years? For questions like that, we definitely want time. So here's a consensus tree that has time on it. And you can see, two billion years ago, it was around there. Um, it was like a million years ago. Yeah. And so we also want to make sure we can figure out, you know, where's the patient rate? species 70 million years ago to 5,000 species now, I can estimate my net multiplication rate from that. But at the end of that, I need a, need a, a time tree, a chronogram. Okay. <coughs> so there's various ways to get this. So, you know, and finally, empirically, you sort of see the pattern, right? Where here we have the white islands. And they're constantly being formed. Like here, always forming the lower minimums, especially the minimums right here now. And then it sort of moves off that hot spot and starts eroding away. It's going from one island, and it's step three. Right? There's some sea mounts here, these three islands, and that's now eroded down. We can take how old those are. And we can figure out, okay, so there's still people here and here. Right? When would that have occurred? So we have a fly species, say, um a very early paper showing this Primates and um, deer, when's that the difference? And then compare the road changes between you know, all those branches. And found this in a pattern. What does that suggest to you? Not quite. No, there's no speciation right here. What? Rate of what's constant? Yep, so rate of is constant. So if I am 15 years ago, I'm going to Why is that cool? Mm -hmm. 
Right. So but if this is true, right, you get this line, then it tell you, okay, I have, you know, some organism and they differ by 50 fat genes. How old is the divergence? So you tell when things diverged um, just based on the amount of change, right? And now, of course, it's more complex than that. That's why it's more complex than that soon. Right? But why might this be, right? So when you think about <coughs> molecular clock, so this basically is called a molecular clock, right? And so what sets what, the rate of the molecular clock? Right? So you probably know this from n section. Right? No mutation per generation, 2n mu, right? There's probably a fixation of one of those mutations. What? Okay, so imagine it's, imagine it's neutral. Okay, so I have what? Yeah. Yep, point five over n. Good. Or one over two n. Okay. One way to derive that, just sort of visually. Here I have all my alleles in the population. One you know, mutant that I care about. Right? Now I come back, you know, a billion years in the future, right? Everything will coalesce, right? Like to one of these ancestors. Right? Which one is it going to be? Well, equal to equal to being this and this and this and this and this and this and this, right? Because they're all neutral. Right? So equal chance of it. So the probability of it being you know, this one is one over the total number of them. Eight. This is a diploid. Boom, just derived it. Okay. All right. So, given this, given this, what's the special number of substitutions per generation? I mean, it's algebra, but it's so cool, right? So you have you know, some mutational process happening, then a eugenic drift, and then boom, together, we mean that the, 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 the rate at which we get new substitutions by population is just based just on my mutation rate. Okay. <coughs> Independent population size. So it has something that has, you know, has a, you know, a, you know, any of a thousand or any of a million. Both the puts picks the same rank. That's pretty cool, right? All right, what could mess it up? I mean, the, whole, the whole thing, the, the engine is drift. We love drift. Migration. How so? So if we have gene flow from another population, but rarely, maybe. If we have gene flow between like two populations we're looking at within a species, it just, just changes what NE is, but it kills out. Actually, even like you have like probably the substructure, it doesn't mess it up, it still works. Cool. What else could mess it up? Mutagens. What do you mean? What? Selection, selection could mess it up. Alright, so if these are under selection in, you know, probably a fixation with selection, that's been in. If we are not neutral, mutagens actually, I mean, could mess it up too, right? Because if we change the mutation, right? Now I live at high altitude and I get more UV and I'm frying my gametes, right? Which is a drink loosened. Um, I mean, jelly chicken. Um, 
then that can increase the mutation rate. And that increase, it increases the rate of the molecular clock. Okay, what else? <coughs> Alright, so I'm already doing a portion of time, right? And this is a portion of the generation. How so? What does that do? As long as these are neutral, it shouldn't matter. No, that shouldn't matter either. Yeah, so this is it's cool. It's, it's robust to like, things that we actually know are happening. Right? Different generation times. Right, different generation times. Right? So elephants versus mice. They're different, different clock rate. Right? Given the same mutation rate. Right. Next what we find is that matters sum up but not as much as we expect it would. So one question after actually actual research question is if we expect generation time to matter in this linear way, then it matters less than that. Why might that be? So we'll investigate. Okay. So comparisons can break it, and so I've got ways to deal with those. Right? But you know for terms of approximation it's pretty good. So what can you do with that? Alright, so if I know <coughs> you know, something about you know, the percent of divergences, right, and I have some way to know that that occurred exactly 6.1 million years ago, then you know, I have my rate of 0.5% per million years, and then I can convert that to a time scale. Let me reduce it to do that and say, okay, an insect mitochondria changed by 1% or 1.5 million years. Use that rate as given how many times. Okay. We don't do it that cavalierly anymore. Right? Um, so it's a little easier way to do that. <coughs> but for a first pass, I mean, it's going to be pretty helpful. Right? So even now, you're looking at a group and say, oh, how you know, well, the difference by 5% of mitochondria. Oh, it must be about this old. You know, so you're off within, you know, maybe, you know, order of 2, order of 5, right? which matters. Okay. <coughs> okay, some it's important jargon to learn for picking out like where put these calibrations on trees. Right. So we talked about so here's what we care about. Right. So we call this the crown group. Okay. And the crown group A is its most recent common ancestor and how old that is. So also this thing up. Right. Okay. So, for <coughs> example, modern birds are clade, right? Archaeopteryx is probably sister to that clade, right? So, in modern birds, right? Archaeopteryx is not here. It's somewhere here, right? Okay. And so. The crown group of modern birds is this. Right? The crown age is this. But the stem age is where the birds attached to the rest of the dinosaurs. Okay. So if I tell you I have a fossil bird, what does that tell you about? Crown age or stem age? Stem age. Really? Is Archaeopteryx a bird? What? Is Archaeopteryx a bird? That's feathers and flies, or glides, or falls slowly. Um, so by most definitions, it's called it's considered a bird. Yeah. yeah. Or if, you know, you have you know, modern birds and have a fossil up here, right? And now I paved this bird's land, let's say. Uh, the age of birds changed? No, right? So, crown group birds has changed, now it's up here. Right? The stem group birds haven't. Okay. And so, saying I have a fossil bird, comes in with the stem age of the crown. The fossil bird could have been coming up here, or coming up here. And we're along, and we could have it yesterday, with the sparrow. 
So it's somewhere from here down to the stem. So fossil calibration is something about stem ages. Okay. Right. So most recent so for the new more minerals. Their most recent common ancestor? Somewhere. It could be. Right. Let's so say if I'm a fossil bird. Good point. So if my clay, if my clay is defined as which is from the ancestor of you know, ostrich and skyrim. Which of what the if you knew it fell within the crown group, it would give you information about the crown group age. Okay. Basically, the stem of wherever it attaches. Yeah. So, if I knew I found a fossil chicken, it tells me something about modern birds. I know it's within modern birds, uh, crown group birds. Yeah. So then, Fossils, you know, they're close to me. Um, right, so the Archaeopteryx here falls somewhere here. So if you knew where this and this evolved, you could say, oh yeah, yeah. then it must have been somewhere after here. If you know, like, you know it occurred somewhere, you can just from someone in this branch, then you know what the other occurred. Because it tells you, you may not call it the age of, crown of birds anymore. It's also a geolocation of this node, not this node. Yep. Right. As yeah, so a crown, this can include the same stuff too. Right. So. Hawaiian honey creepers are in crowded with birds. Okay. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because if I say, you know, I'm trying to figure out the age of beetles, right? And I have a fossil beetle from the Dominican amber and it's 25 million years old. Right? Does that mean beetles are 25 million years old? No, I mean, we actually don't know that, but, you know, um, <coughs> no, it tells us that there are beetles attached to the rest of the tree of life. It's really, really good. It could have been a stem group beetle. Okay. Um, people make the mistake all the time. It was a paper came out on ant evolution, came out on science. And it's something there whose entire role in the paper was adding fossils to the tree. And he made a mistake about stem group, ground group thing, about age of ground. Okay, so this is something easy to get correct. That's a separate issue. You could say, yeah, so. Yeah. So I can't 
hear about beetles, right? And I find some fossil beetle that could have been here, right? So it could have been from here, it could have been attached to here instead. So I don't know anything that it's this node, I know that it's this node. So, right. And so I know that this node is at least that old, possibly old. So it's, again, it's a minimum age. Right? So I have a dinosaur in my freezer at home called a chicken. It's a week old. Right? So I know that crown group birds, oh, I know that the stem group between you know, birds and crocs is at least a week old. Right? Is it exactly a week old? No, I can't exactly use it as a fixed calibration point. Right? I know it's at least a week old, but not, not exactly a week old. Okay? And then something that matters when you're talking about dating things. Um, <coughs> fossil dates often give you minimums, not actual dates. Now, in the Bayesian context we're going to talk about later today, what we're going to do is say, well, <coughs> yeah, I know it gives me this age, but I think then that you know, this age can't be more than five million years old than that. All right, so it's okay. Yeah, minimum of this, maximum of this, five million years old. Pull a fryer, put it somewhere, use it. All right. Or I could say, you know, given the age is, um, you know, friend fossil is 15 million years old. So if it's some sort of distribution where I think the node is, you know, probably this, pretty much what it is. That's some sort of log normal distribution. Okay. And so we're talking about Mr. Beast, or well, the, uh, with Beast, not Mr. Bayes, is something that where you can specify this prior okay. and figure out the ages. Okay. There are other programs that just use them as sort of constraints. It says, okay, this is at least. 15 million years old, from 15 million, you know, to current age of the universe old. Right. Which, on the other hand, which, you know, doesn't make you, make you have any weird hypothesis about how old it could be. On the other hand, it's quite a wide range. Um, so what we might want to do is have a, a known age. Say, okay, you have, I know this split happened exactly when Gondwana split. We have a fixed age for that. Okay. Or for angiosperms, we know that this is common pollen type. Yes, we see everywhere after some time period, but not before them. So we think that plants that had the pollen, you know, must remember this is before that time period. Right. And this has a maximum age for that group. Okay. But finding maximum ages is actually hard. Um, but you know, maybe we can get more into it. Well, no, so I mean, we, we could, so. You need some way of getting maximum ages, or you need some way of putting a prior on it. Because otherwise, it's, you say, okay, you know, birds are at least a week old because of my freezer. It would be a week to five, 15 billion, right? And there's no way to say which. But you say, I think it's a week old, but I think, you know, a week old is more likely than two weeks old, more likely than three weeks old, but it moves no optimum back to the Yeah, so there's some other external information. Or if I say, it's at least a week old, I know it can't be older than, you know, half a billion years old, I know about the Cambrian explosion. Right, this is a more of a constraint. Okay, questions about this? More questions about this? <coughs> okay. Um, <coughs> so the problem is hard using bi biogeography too. So people sometimes use this when I have Hawaii example, right? Where we have different areas and we have different areas. Different areas. Different areas. Different areas. Different areas. Let's go to some nice age, right? That's when things happen. Well, it might not have happened. Right? So it could have had <coughs> speciation that happened in one area, wind area. Or maybe another range here, because a lot of speciation had happened. And then later than that's in there. And so then it could have um, my speciation that actually predating to those in the age. Or it could have a massive growth over there, you know, one. But then we had the first of one area from the area. And so it's simply due to the after the area. And luckily, we used to use these, you know, this biogeography information to actually give us fixed ages. But that's problematic too. Any questions about that? No, there actually was a thought for a while in biogeography, so it is that you can't have dispersal. 
So if things have arrived, I will go. But any clips you have reflect when the area is splitting. It's called dispersal, uh, uh, the carrying's only view. Okay. Most biographers realize that you can have to get dispersal too. I think it's why it ends up there by land groups that you can get dispersal there by land groups. So for Darwin Day, actually, this year, we're having some speaker come in and talk about this sort of issue. Yeah, in February. Okay. <coughs> so in practice, what do you do for single rate calibration? Okay, so first you get a molecular tree, right? And the tree might be something like Where branch is a proportional amount of, amount of change. Okay. So now I can do a likelihood ratio test. Comparing what with what? What does this mean? Now, knowing what we know about how we do these model comparisons now, how can I do that sort of test? What does what getting T involved entail? So if, I have, if this phylogeny is of extant organisms, right, stuff that's alive right now, right, how can I constrain this analysis to return a tree that matches this proportion of the time? What would that look like? Right, so it's coeval. Right? So, you know, like that, right? Such that, um, you know, if this is for sample today, this sample today, it must look occur today, right? So it has to be a tree constrained so that these are all the same time period, right? So what I could do is write run a search where I have, you know, all branch lengths to vary and have them vary however they want to, right? Or have them vary such that all the equivalents all sum to one, all sum all the same number. Right, so I could do it either way. Um, which is a which will, which will have the better likelihood? So this one, <coughs> I'm allowing everything to vary for the seed step. This one all constrained. Right? Now this one could result in a tree that's just like this. Right? So the likelihood is exactly equal. Right? If anything else, you know, it would suggest that this tree did have better likelihood. Okay. Does that make sense? Right. So I'm doing coin flipping, right? And you know, I have Heads, heads, tails, heads. One model I could have that has you know, all such the same frequency. Click, 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 click. Another model has it as one, one, zero, one. Right. This fits much, much better. Much better likelihood, right? Probably getting H here, one. Probably getting H here, one. Probably getting T here, one. Probably getting H here, one. Right. Much better likelihood. Right. It's crazy town, right? You have Main parameters that he has observations. Right. So, yeah, the likely to be better, but it's not a good model. And like AIC would make that a good model. Right. Whereas here, you know, it's a much simpler model than fit better, even though the likelihood is not as good. Right. The probability of H here is 0 0.6 times 0 0.6 times 0.4 and 0.6. That'd be lots of good. Right. A lot worse than 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1. Is that clear? It's set so that you know this branch length can do whatever it wants to be to out to maximize likelihood, and so can this. Within this tree, this must equal this. Right? So it has to compromise. 
will be here. Mm-hmm. Right. So you'll talk true, right? But the, but the clock is a strong assumption about rate rates being similar, right? It's portion to you. It could be that's not the case because of the generation time or various factors. Right? right. So if you're doing this sort of approach, you would test the clock. You know, it's not rejected. You know, if this model is not much worse than this model, oh yeah, you can go ahead with that using the clock model. If, and then you can um, <coughs> you know, find a flat calibration point, calibrate, and run it. Right. If it is rejected, right, and as you add more data, it's more likely to get rejected, right? It's more, you know, more and more power to reject the null. Yep, you have more power to reject the null. So you want to reject the clock, right? Um, there's some procedures you can do to you know, throw out the bad taxa or um, I'm going to talk about better approaches now in a minute. Like, oh, this, this, one's re this one's really long. This is now. And there's algorithms for this, so it makes it sound legit. Right. And we know, like, like, in insects, for example, flies have these crazy long branches. And so it actually is Sorbsiptera, twisted wind parasites. Really cool. And they're like, okay, yeah. They're just well, wacky. If you cut them out, everything else looks pretty clock like. So maybe it's. So it's not as bad as it sounds. But it's not what we do much anymore. But sort of, what I'm trying to get you to do is understand like the okay, like ratio test, how you can use that, and what people used to do. So we read older papers, and calibrating trees, how they do that. Okay, so, so problems with this. Trees aren't often precisely clock-like. <coughs> so here's a science paper looking at the book of excellence okay. of excellent things. What do you notice? Right. You notice any sort of trends in the bias? And the color. Right, so the rate is higher for herbs. Good. What about branch lines? Spread into the truck. Why would that be? Well, the branch time. Yep. Maybe it's also better at repairing the mutation, but it's not more mutation rate. It's probably a generation like that. And so, you can see then the connecting and so on. There's still other patterns, right? Like this and this. Maybe they also better generate. Um, there's uncertainty in fossil time. Really right? So, you know, I use my one week old chicken in the freezer. You know, that's probably a bad <laughs> estimate for chicken age because it fits constraint. Right? Even if I knew exactly that it was a good clade minimum and maximum age, right? there's still uncertainty in fossil record. So, fossils aren't known. You know, this fossil is 65.32153 million years old. Right, it's 65, <coughs> it's minus a couple million years. Um, finally, the of the tree continues over time. Right? So, <coughs> reason calibration might give a bad estimate for earlier parts of the tree. If I have my you know, overall giant tree life, right? and I have an estimate for you know, the up here, right? extrapolating that rate across the entire tree, We'll get more and more errors as you go down. Right. And so, here's a famous example of that. Right. So, early colonization of land by plants. So, the first fossil land plants occurred you know, 40, 40, 40, 40 years ago. Um, these are fossils. It's one o'clock, 600 million years ago. Pre Cambrian plants on land. So, these kind of aren't working hard for that you know, 15 million years or so. Um, but then, looking at it with better <coughs> um, data, right, uh, 
You obviously have some molecular clock studies where initial like sort of analyses with less less data or less good data result in overestimates. With more as you get more data, get better estimates, right? Because you think about estimating this, <coughs> you know, if you underestimate it, that's bounded by zero, right? The overestimate is bounded by infinity. Right? So you have uncertainty here if you look at the error bars, and something more like that. So with uncertainty, you're not going to get it to be over. Okay. I'm actually preparing a paper in the lab on an early analysis of, oh no, actually a fairly recent analysis of angi square mage, where they used beast for using today and found it really, really old. And actually using a newer analysis, find that actually has some bias in beast. And actually they're aged probably younger, more like what pedagogists tell us. But you know, no point to even look at that, just talk to pedagogists instead. But just to show, you know, what this means, so here's a really good plot of the history of life. And note this really long period when something's happening at the macro level. It's really cool to think about. Um, so fossils, say, plants, plants appeared on land then, right? The first make a clock study, said way back here, right? And then a more recent clock study, right there. Right, so if you're doing it well, you can actually get good estimates, you very easily go wrong. Right, so again, be cautious. Okay. So approach is not requiring a clock, so there's several. Okay. Um, one is not prepared to make rate smoothing, one is kind of like replicate, and one is a really set of Bayesian approaches. Let's talk about these now. Okay. And again, I want you to know sort of how these work but actually the details you know, for the test. So the input for this is not the raw data, but it's the spilogram. Right. And then constraints as well. So age of the fossils and things like that. And the output is a chronogram. Okay, the constraints are things like at least 25 million years old for that age, exactly 7 million years old for that age. Okay. And then what you can imagine is a different rate on every branch. And there's some constraints show up for this, right? So we talked about how here we have to have these at the same time. Right? There's no way if this is my actual amount of luck that change, these rates can be equal. Right? Because I have the same rate, but I have the same number of branch lines going down. That is the rates. So what I could make um, So what we would be like, but we might assume though that rates are similar between neighboring taxa. Right? If I have a woody, a woody lineage, they're all pretty much similar in rate. Rates of lineage are all pretty much similar in rate. It's got the same correlation across the tree. Right? It can change, but it's correlated. And so what this tries to do is minimize the difference between you know this ray and an industrial ray. And this ray and Um, <coughs> and then sort of the kinds of traits too. That's what we know. We start to get that between the middle of us such that point in the tree, and so then this will be able to do that. Well, in, in real life, traits are all, I mean, Nothing's exactly equal across all of life, anyway. Right. But in, the, in general cases where you don't have something that matches a clock like tree, something like this would be good. Yeah. Okay, that's one approach. And then a later approach um, is a kind of liquid approach where we have likelihood of these branch ones given a set of rates and times. Right? And then all this penalty for rate changes. Okay, it's a waiting term to combine them. Okay. 
and so the torture works a little bit better. Okay. And there's some sort of, it's for the quasi life that approach. Right? If they have lethia there, well, I'll, I'll have this sort of parent that's sitting out front. It's not based on lethia or a model, but it's based on, and the best part of model has these three things similar. Okay. There's ways to set, the, set what the parameter should be and things like that. All right, so Bayesian approaches. Yeah. Oh, so just notation. So this is rate three. So this one, the ancestor of three. Oh, so it's just going to be. Yeah. All right. So Bayesian approaches. So I might say, rather than saying this as, you know, this must be exactly 7, I can say, OK, there's a mean of 7 and some sort of uncertainty around that. So I can put, so I can put that information I already have before I start my analysis as a prior. And this prior information I have going in, I use that as a sort of distribution. OK. And this other one, being at least 25 million years, right? What I can do is say, all right, so at least 25 million, and then we'll be 50 million. It's going to be maybe 27 million, maybe 3 million. That's it. How am I going to set this width? Oh. Average rate. Average rate. Average rate. Average rate. So when I start this, I don't have the rates. So I have these. Yeah. Well, here's an information about how good the fossil record is. Right? So we're thinking about, you know, that set of, we have tricolpate pollen everywhere, and then not the force that's okay. I'm pretty sure that it's very good. Maybe a lot of stuff from the plus and 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 one sort of college mystery right now is figuring out ways to set these priors intelligently rather than sort of like, yeah, 15. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, there are some objective methods, but we don't use them much. It's still pretty. It's Bayesian. Get a prior. Go for it. Okay. You can get a prior on times as well. Um, also, prior on rates. Okay. Also, you have other parameters in the model. You get a prior on those too. Okay. Um, one thing sometimes people do is they don't want to commit to a prior. They'll do a hyper prior. So, a prior on a prior. Then it's okay. And it's also, I mean, there are empirical Bayesian techniques where you can get the priors from the key from the data and things like that. So, um, or you might go for an form of priors that they can't. Right. So an unformative prior here could be this age goes from zero to a billion. Maybe unformative. Not very useful. Okay. And so this all into one equation. Okay. And you'll, you'll see equations like this. To unpack it. Right, the posterior probability. Right, that's what we're trying to get. Right. We're not trying to maximize, we're trying to estimate the posterior probability of this tree being 6 million years old is you know, 10%. Probably being at least 6 million years old is 5%. And so you get that distribution of confidence. Okay. We have our good friend likelihood. And then we have the priors. And if we have something like age constraints, that comes in there. Right. And so that, all the time constraints go in there. And then we have, if you allow you know, auto correlation of rates, and you have one left of it, this rate comes in this rate, and you put it in there. We also have uncorrelated rates, too. Okay. And then the denominator, right, 
to be sung in front of our friends. Which of course is hard to do. So what we do is take the MCMC approach to estimate the control time. That's what we do MCMC. Because it's not really too hard. So just as for search phylogeny, the output is a set of trees, and this is a set of chronograms. So this whole analysis, you get out this cloud of trees, and you say, okay, you know, for this particular node, 95 trees have a premium buffer range. I'm going to give you a credible engine. Okay? Which then gives you a confidence measure. Right? So 95% sure the you know, mammals evolved Within, you know, within five million years of, you know, years or something like that. Okay. Um, assuming your priors are good and your models are good. Okay. So what, sometimes what, might people, what people might do is try different priors and see if it depends on the priors. Right. Um, yeah. Even as it does. Any questions about that? You have all of them, yeah. If you don't want to, you have to. Yeah. Yeah. And then most people, you, know, you might have a prior on like age of mammals, or you might have based on fossil data. You probably don't wake up in the morning with a prior on the rate of substitution at CO1, right? We need to have some way to specify that. Okay. Let's take a five minute break, and then we'll come back and start doing some empirical. Analysis. That's it. Three forty seven by the clock. Okay. In the meantime, you can go to the website and download the pack, the software we talked about today. It's free. It works on PCs and Macs and Linux. Mesquite and also then Beast as well. It's clean, it's functional. <laughs> 